Welcome to your deep dive. Today, we're going to dig into something I think you'll find really relevant, especially with your background. We're cracking open Carl von Clausewitz's On War. A classic. Definitely a classic. And we're going to dissect chapters 9 through 12 from book 7. It can be tough to get through, so we're going to break down these chapters on attacking defensive positions. And hopefully, we'll pull out some of those golden nuggets, those pieces of insight that are still relevant today, even on today's battlefield. Absolutely. We're going to be looking at how Clausewitz's ideas about attacking, well, you know, entrenched camps, those mountain positions, even those really spread out cordon lines, how those apply in both classic and modern military contexts. I am ready to get tactical. Let's do it. So to start off, for those of us who might need a little refresher course, who was this Clausewitz guy and why should we even care about what he had to say about war? So Karl von Clausewitz was a Prussian general back in the late 1700s, early 1800s. Okay. He saw the Napoleonic Wars firsthand. Wow. Yeah, a time of just absolutely massive military upheaval. And really, his most famous work on war wasn't actually even finished until after his death. No. But it's considered essential reading even now for military strategists. So he wasn't just some guy theorizing from some comfy armchair. He was there. Oh, he was in the trenches. Yeah, so to speak. That firsthand experience is why his insights about defense and offense are still studied today in military schools around the world. Interesting. Yeah, Clausewitz really wanted people to understand that war is this constantly changing thing. He knew, of course, that strategy and tactics were super important, but he also highlighted how things like uh, politics and even psychology play a huge role in how wars are fought, you know, and who wins. Right. So it's almost like he was saying even back then that warfare is more than just, like you said, troops and trenches. That's a great way to put it. So he's writing in the 19th century talking about these like fortifications and, you know, armies marching across open fields. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to wrap my head around how that translates to how we fight wars now. You oh. know, all our technology and the different types of conflicts going on. It seems vastly different from you know, muskets and cannons. That's the million dollar question, right? Even though the weapons have changed, the core principles, those ideas about strategy and how you move your troops and outsmart the other guy, those are still the core of warfare. Okay. So let's jump into chapter nine, where Clausewitz really gets into how to attack defensive positions generally. Okay. Sounds good. What does Clausewitz say about going up against a fortified enemy? Well, he starts off by saying something that seems kind of obvious, but is often forgotten in the heat of the moment. Not all defensive positions are created equal. Yeah, okay. Some are almost impossible to break and you need a totally different strategy. While others, you can kind of go around or neutralize without having to go head to head, you know, in a big confrontation. So it's like picking your battles, right? Don't waste time, resources, lives on a frontal assault if you can maneuver around the enemy or just outsmart them entirely. Right. And Clausewitz argues that attacking head on when the enemy is really well dug in, it's incredibly risky. And that's even if you've got more troops, even if you've got more firepower mm. to really hammer this home. He uses the example of the lines of Torres Vedras during the Napoleonic Wars. Have you heard of those? Yeah. Weren't those some pretty impressive fortifications? They were. So we're talking about a series of defensive positions built by the British and Portuguese, and they built them specifically to protect Lisbon from the French. Makes sense. And these lines were so well designed, so well defended, that the French, they just couldn't break through. Wow. It really just highlights the importance of picking the right defensive strategy for the situation, right? And it's a huge lesson in how effective a well-planned, well-executed defense can be, even if you're going up against a bigger, stronger enemy. That's pretty amazing. And I guess it kind of leads us to thinking about how, with all the advancements we've made, militaries have had to adapt their strategies for attacking those really fortified positions today. For sure. I mean, it really makes you think about how technology has changed everything. We have long range missiles now, yeah. you know, drones, even cyber warfare, all these things that can strike from a distance. Mm -hmm. It's pretty mind boggling when you think about it. Yeah. How do you even start to figure out a plan of attack against a modern day fortress? Well, and that's where things get really, really interesting, right? Technology has definitely changed the whole idea of a battlefield. Think about air power alone. Right. We can hit targets that are way behind enemy lines or cyber attacks. You can cripple infrastructure. You can knock out communications networks in seconds. Yeah. 
all of that stuff really makes that old image of a fortress, like something out of a movie, you know, with big walls that can't be broken. That's just not really realistic anymore. Right. So it seems like it's less about just brute force now mm -hmm. and more about finding those weaknesses, finding those pressure points and exploiting them, whether it's through technology or intelligence or a combination of both. You got it. Even with all of our fancy technology, Clausewitz's whole emphasis on carefully analyzing your opponent's defenses, really taking the time to understand their strengths and weaknesses, that's more important now than ever. It's not just about having the best tech, it's about knowing how to use it strategically to give yourself every advantage and minimize your risks. Yeah, it's more like chess than checkers now. Exactly. You can't just go charging in. You have to think several moves ahead. A hundred percent. So even in the 21st century, Clausewitz is still there whispering in our ear, analyze everything. Now, he also talks about these entrenched camps, which I imagine were a big deal back then. Oh, yeah, definitely they were. So in Chapter 10, he challenges what a lot of people believed at the time. Back then, the thinking was that entrenched camps were kind of ineffective, but he argues that a well-fortified camp, especially when it's well-defended, can completely change the game in war. So it's not just about digging a ditch and hoping for the best. No, not at all. Klausowitz, he uses the example of Frederick the Great and how he hesitated to attack the entrenched camp at Pirna during the Seven Years' War. Interesting. Yeah, and this is really significant because Frederick the Great he was famous for being a really aggressive military leader, and if he was hesitant... That's saying something. If Frederick the Great, who was like a total rock star when it came to military strategy, if he was hesitant, those entrenchments must have been seriously intimidating. Exactly. The camp at Pirna, it basically acted as this huge deterrent, and it forced Frederick to completely rethink that direct attack. And this gets at a key idea for Klausowitz. Understanding the psychology of your enemy, right? A strong defense doesn't just protect your soldiers and your stuff. Mm -hmm. It also makes the enemy doubt themselves. They get scared. That can delay them, and that delay can buy you really valuable time. Right. Like they say, sometimes the best offense is a good defense. Exactly. So when you compare fortifications today to those in Clausewitz's time, what's changed? I mean, we've gone from trenches to underground bunkers. It's yeah. a totally different ballgame. That's true. You're right. We don't see those traditional linear fortifications as often these days. But the idea of an entrenched camp is still really important. Think about those modern, heavily fortified bases we have now. The ones with the underground bunkers, really complex air defenses, electronic warfare capabilities. Or places that are designed to withstand almost anything, right? Exactly. Imagine massive underground facilities that are literally built to survive bunker-busting bombs. Or you have command centers that are shielded against EMPs. Oh. The technology, it's changed a lot, but that basic idea of creating a really, really well-defended position, it's still central to warfare today. So it seems like it's about understanding those core principles behind fortifications and then figuring out how to do those same things with today's technology. You got it. And that's one of the things that makes studying class of it so valuable, even today. He really makes you think differently about the relationship between offense and defense, between technology and strategy. He makes you think outside the box. Yes. And that's so important because warfare itself is constantly changing. Constantly evolving. Mm -hmm. So in Chapter 11, he talks about a different kind of terrain. He talks about mountains. Yes. And this is where he throws us a bit of a curveball. Ooh, I love a good curveball. Hit me with it. So what if I told you that Clausewitz actually suggests that attacking an enemy who's in a prepared position, you know, they're dug in, in the mountains, yeah. that attacking them might actually be preferable to fighting them out in the open. Really? That's wild. I would think that having the high ground, that's always been the key thing in military strategy, right? Why would he say that? It is interesting. He has a few points here. So first, he says that in the mountains, the attacker often has the element of surprise on their side. You've got this defending force. They're up there. They feel really secure in their mountain fortress. They might not expect a full-on assault. They're caught off guard. Exactly. The second point, and this is really interesting, he says that the mountains themselves can actually work against the defender's morale. What's How so? So if the attacker can threaten that line of retreat, you know, that way out, the defenders, they might panic. Oh, I see. And they might abandon even a really strong position. So it all comes back to psychology, doesn't it? It really does. It's like he's saying, use the terrain, even if it seems like it's working against you. Exactly. It's important to remember the context here, though. Controlling those mountain passes has always been super important, right? Oh, yeah. And throughout history, armies, they always tried to get to those passes first. Right. Klausowitz isn't saying 
ignore that. He's saying, hey, consider the psychological edge that an attacker might have even in these places that seem really hard to attack. So it's not just about the terrain itself, the physical mountain, but also about what's going on in the minds of the people fighting in those mountains. Yes. It's like a game of chess, but you're playing on the side of a mountain. And if you can cut off those supply lines, those escape routes, even the strongest defensive position, it becomes a trap. You got it. But of course, we have to think about how technology has changed the game when it comes to fighting in the mountains. I mean, air power has completely changed how those battles are fought. Right. It's not so easy to hide anymore. You've got satellites and drones watching your every move. That's true. It's much harder to surprise anyone these days. And air power, it can definitely dislodge an enemy from even those well-defended mountain positions. But even with all that, understanding the terrain, that's still absolutely crucial. And those ideas that Klosowitz had about the psychology of fighting in the mountains, they're still relevant. He really makes you rethink those traditional military principles, doesn't he? He does. He really makes you question your assumptions. And that's what makes his writing so fascinating. Yeah, totally. He's not giving you a playbook. He's making you think. That's a great way to put it. So one last terrain type to cover here. Cordon lines. What exactly are those? And what does our Prussian strategist have to say about those? So in Chapter 12, Klausowitz describes cordon lines as these really long defensive lines that are actually pretty vulnerable. Hey. Imagine a thin line of troops stretched out over a really, really big area. So it's more about having a presence in those areas, not necessarily creating an unbreakable wall. Precisely. Okay. He argues that, and this makes sense, that while they're not that hard to break through, attacking them might not actually be worth the effort, especially if it doesn't lead to a decisive victory. Right. Don't get distracted by small victories if they don't actually get you closer to your objective. Exactly. And to illustrate this, he uses the example of the lines of Denain in 1712. Okay. What happened there? Tell me about Denain. So the French, under the command of Villar, they break through the Allied lines at Denain. Now, this victory, it wasn't some massive battle on its own, but it ended up being a turning point. Oh, interesting. Yeah, it changed the balance of power and eventually led to a French victory in that entire conflict. So, a small victory. But strategically, it was incredibly important. It's like knocking over that first domino. Yeah, and it highlights how important it is to think about tactics, strategy, and political goals, how they all fit together. You have to think several moves ahead, just like a master chess player would. It's not just about winning the battle, it's about winning the war, right? Exactly. And while you don't see those traditional cordon lines as often in modern warfare, the principle behind them, that's still hugely relevant. How so? What would be a modern day example of a cordon line? Think about a scenario where a force is stretched really thin, trying to control a big city, maybe a long border, or imagine you've got this cyber defense network and it's totally overwhelmed trying to protect against attacks from everywhere. Right, they're spread too thin. Yes. And in those situations, an enemy, if they're really determined, they can find those gaps, those weaknesses, and exploit them. So sometimes showing force when you're spread out like that, it can actually be a sign of weakness. It's it makes you realize that no matter how fancy our technology gets, those old school military principle, those ideas about maneuverability and knowing when and where to concentrate your forces, and most importantly, having a crystal clear picture of what you're trying to achieve, all of that still matters. Technology alone isn't going to win a war. That's a great point. And it takes us back to something Klausowitz understood really well. War is a human thing. It's impacted by psychology, by geography, by political will. That's a really great way to sum up what we've been talking about. This has been such an interesting look at Clausewitz's ideas on how to attack these defensive positions. It's like we got a peek inside the mind of a military genius. Yeah, absolutely. And the amazing thing is how relevant his writing still is, even in the 21st century. It really is. His focus on critical thinking, on being able to adapt quickly, and understanding how all these different factors, technology, politics, the human element, how they all work together, that's more important now than ever. And the beauty of reading Clausewitz is that he doesn't just describe those historical examples. He actually pulls out these like timeless nuggets of wisdom that we can still use today. Right. It's like he's giving us this masterclass in military strategy, but it's a masterclass that transcends time. Yeah, totally. <laughs> I am here for it. So how do we take those 19th century principles, right, and 
apply them now in the 21st century. We're talking drones instead of dragoons, mm -hmm. you know, cyber warfare, not cavalry charges. Right. It's a completely different game. It is. And that's actually where Clausewitz's thinking really shines, I think. He's not giving us this list of outdated tactics. He's giving us this framework that helps us understand what conflict really is at its core. Okay, I like that. Like his work, it's more like a toolbox than a to-do list, you know? A toolbox, right. So it's all about adapting the tools to the job, right? Exactly. How would we use that framework when we're thinking about those modern, heavily fortified bases? Mm -hmm. They're a lot different from the entrenched camps that Clausewitz would seem. Right? Yeah, on the surface, for sure. But if you look a bit deeper, those core concepts are still there. Okay. So Clausewitz, he's always warning us that going head on against a strong defense, it usually ends badly. Right. He always emphasizes maneuver, deception, finding those weak points. It's about being strategic, not just aggressive. So even with all the technology that's available to us now, those fundamental principles are still true. Absolutely. Think about defense in depth. Okay. It's a military doctrine that's used a lot today, and its roots go right back to Clausewitz. Instead of just having one big impenetrable line of defense, you create layers. Okay. Each one is designed to slow down the enemy and weaken them. Kind of like a castle with rings of walls. Right? right, so you're making it way harder for them to break through. Exactly. You force them to use up their resources, they show you what their plans are, and that gives you a chance to strike back. Now, these layers, they can be physical with actual lines of defense, but they can also be technological. Oh, I see. So you could use electronic warfare to mess with their communications. Maybe you've got cyber offenses to protect things like infrastructure. Yeah. Or even have troops on standby who are ready to move in if there's a breach. It's like a digital fortress. Exactly. It's about creating this really complex, adaptable defense, one that can't be taken down with just one attack. Right. A modern-day fortress, it's not just concrete and steel. It's about information. It's about adaptation. It's about always being one step ahead. Yeah, it's like you're playing 3D chess trying to predict what the other guy's going to do and having a response ready to go. That's a great way to put it. Yeah. And that actually leads us to another really important part of Clausewitz's thinking, really understanding your enemy. Right. He said you can't beat an enemy that you don't understand. Knowledge is power. Thanks, Dad. It's not just about having the biggest guns or the coolest gadgets, right? You have to get inside your enemy's head, figure out their strengths, weaknesses, how they think. So what are their goals? What are their limitations? What are they afraid of? You have to ask those questions. You got it. You yeah. gotta see the world through their eyes, even if you don't like what you see. Because if you can do that, yeah. if you can really understand your enemy's motivations, that can be just as important as any weapon, can't it? For sure. And let's apply that to something like cyber warfare, which is something Klausowitz, of course, could never have imagined. Okay, yeah. I'm curious about this. How does understanding your enemy play out in cyberspace? It's a completely different battlefield, right? I mean, you're fighting with the lines of code instead of with actual soldiers. Yeah. But in a way, it's even more important in the cyber warfare. Really? How so? Well, obviously knowing their tactics, their favorite malware, what they usually go after, that's important. But you've got to go deeper than that. You need to understand their motives, their goals, the pressures they might be facing back home. Hmm. And that can give you a sort of roadmap, right? You might figure out who they're going to target, what kind of strategies they'll use. So you can kind of get ahead of them. You might even figure out a way to stop them from attacking in the first place. So it's like you're launching a preemptive strike, but instead of using bombs, you're using intel and information. Yeah. You're using that deep understanding of how the enemy thinks. Exactly. It's using knowledge as a weapon, which is what Clausewitz was all about. It all comes back to Clausewitz. It always does. He really understood the human side of war, that psychology of conflict, and that's why he's still so incredibly relevant today, even as the world becomes more digital, more tech-driven. Because behind every computer terminal, there's a person, right? Absolutely. A person with fears, goals, motivations. And understanding those human factors, that's often the key to winning. Now, another thing that Clausewitz talks about is maneuver. How does that concept work in modern warfare? I mean, battles are fought over huge distances using all sorts of different tools. It's not like marching an army across a field anymore. Exactly. That's such a great point. Maneuver has definitely evolved. It's not just about moving 
tanks and infantry around anymore. It's about getting yourself into a better position, whether that's a physical position, a technological advantage, or even a psychological one. It's about being flexible, about adapting to whatever comes up. So you're still trying to control the chessboard. It's just that the chessboard has gotten a lot bigger, a lot more complicated. Exactly. Think about air power, for example. Okay, how does maneuver play into air power? Well, in modern warfare, controlling the skies, what we call air superiority, that's often crucial for winning battles on the ground. But it's not just about having more planes than the other guy. It's about using those planes strategically, coordinating with your ground forces, making sure the enemy can't use their own air power effectively. So you're shaping the battlefield, even if that battlefield is thousands of feet in the air. Precisely. And that kind of maneuverability, it's not limited to the air either. Think about cyber warfare. You have to be able to quickly get your defenses in place, shift your resources around to counter an attack. You might even want to mislead the enemy about what you're going to do next. Right. Keep them guessing. Exactly. That's all maneuver, just in the digital domain. It's about being agile, being able to adapt on the fly, and always staying one step ahead, especially in a world where things can change so fast. You got it. Those are the things that make for effective maneuver in the 21st century. So interesting. It's amazing to see how you can take these principles, these timeless ideas, and apply them to completely new ways of fighting wars. It really is. Now, you mentioned before that Kosovitz really stressed the importance of winning the war, not just winning individual battles. Mm -hmm. How does that factor into his thinking when it comes to attacking those defensive positions? That's huge. For Clausewitz, war wasn't just about racking up victories on the battlefield. It was about achieving political goals. And every military action you took, even if it was something as specific as attacking one defensive position, it had to make sense within that larger strategic context. So it's about understanding the why behind yeah. every what. You have to keep the big picture in mind. Exactly. You don't attack a defensive position just because you can. You need to be asking yourself, what am I going to gain from this? How will this help me achieve my overall objectives? Is this really the best way to use my resources? Because if you're not careful, you end up wasting resources, troops, time, all on targets that don't really matter in the grand scheme of things. It's like you're so focused on winning this one little battle that you lose sight of the whole war. Right. And for Klausowitz, that was a recipe for disaster. You have to remember, he saw war as this extension of politics, a way to achieve those big picture political goals. Okay. And like any tool, you have to use it strategically, not just start swinging it around. You'll hurt yourself that way. Exactly. So choose your battles. Understand what you're risking and what you'll gain. It's amazing to me how even when we're talking about these super specific tactics like how to attack a bunker or something, we keep coming back to that strategic context. It's all connected. And Klausowitz got that. He understood how those different levels of warfare, that tactical level and the strategic level, the immediate goal and the ultimate goal, they all work together. They influence each other. Yeah. And it's easy to get caught up in just one part of it, but you have to see how it all connects. Look at spider web, right? Each strand is a decision, an action, and they all affect each other. I like that. That's a great way to think about it. And Klausowitz, he really was a master at understanding those complex connections. He really makes you think, you know. It's not just about memorizing battle plans, is it? It's about learning how to think critically, how to adjust your plans when things change, which happens all the time in war. All the time. And that's why his work is still so incredibly relevant for anyone in the military, even today. He doesn't give you the answers. No, he doesn't, but he does give you the tools to figure out the right questions to ask. Which is even more valuable, Absolutely. Right? I mean, the world is changing so fast, the nature of war is changing, you need those critical thinking skills more than ever. Well, this has been an amazing conversation. We've covered so much ground here, from talking about fortifications and how technology has changed, to that whole idea of the psychology of war and what conflict really even is. It's pretty deep stuff. Yeah, it's a lot to think about. We've really gone deep on Klausowitz's ideas about how to attack those defensive positions. And even though he was writing almost 200 years ago, it's amazing how much his writing still applies today. Totally. We talked about maneuver, deception, the importance of really getting inside your enemy's head and figuring mm -hmm. out how they think and never losing sight of that strategic objective. Never. We talked about how those principles, they don't just apply to those traditional battles either, right? Cyber warfare, these new kinds of conflicts we're seeing, all of those classic principles still matter. It really shows you that Clausewitz's work isn't just something you'd read in a history class. 
It's still shaping how we think about strategy, about conflicts, about how to achieve victory on the battlefield. It's almost like he left this roadmap for us, something we can use to navigate all the complexities of war, even as the world around us changes. That's a great way to put it. He gave us this way of understanding not just how to fight a war, but why we fight. The why, that's huge. It is huge, and I think that's really why his work has stood the test of time. Absolutely. It's not just about tactics. So as we wrap up our deep dive here, we want to leave you with one last thing to think about, especially given all your experience in the military. If Klausowitz were alive today, if he could see how wars are fought now, all the technology and everything, what do you think he would say is the toughest challenge, the most difficult defensive position to overcome? What would make him stop and say, now that, that is a fortress? What do you think? Would it be some kind of like super high tech underground bunker that's built to withstand anything? Or maybe a network, some kind of digital fortress that's so vast and complex, so embedded in everything we do that it's almost impossible to attack using those old ways of thinking? It's a great question. It really is. And it's something we'll leave you to ponder. But I think Clausewitz would remind us, just like he did in his writing, that even as things change, those core principles, the importance of strategy, the psychology of conflict, those things endure. They're timeless. They are. So keep thinking strategically. And thanks for joining us on our deep dive into the brilliant mind of Karl von Clausewitz. See you next time.